So the purpose of this meeting is to review for the unit one exam. Uh, as you hopefully know, uh, exams are extremely important. They constitute 70% of your grade. Um, and so for that reason, you definitely wanna, you know, do everything you can to be ready. I, if you're one of those people that just wants to blaze through the course and you're not concerned about getting an A, you know, more power to you, but, uh, um, these review sessions are targeted to really kind of help you um, prepare for the exam. Okay, so any questions before I start? And you can utilize the chat or you can utilize the, um, or you can just talk. <laughs> uh, if there's no questions, I'm gonna kind of go into my spiel. And I will say this uh, right off the bat, having, I, I looked at the exam you know, we still got some people joining. So uh, I did look at the exam and there are a number of questions that look to me like they're from the textbook. And I think there's also pretty good evidence that a lot of the questions are actually from the publisher. So the advice that I had given previously that, you know, in, in my live course, I don't rely on the textbook very much at all. I practically ignore it. Um, this class, I strongly recommend looking at the textbook just based on what's in the questions. Okay, so with that being said, um, I'll go over, uh, we're gonna start with the outline and the basics and then um, I'll give you some targeted uh, advice as, as far as what to specifically to study. Okay, so let me start my screen share. Okay, now, if you weren't in the last meeting, um, this outline that I'm looking at is one that was sent out to all of you guys in a uh, attached file attachment. And it's my uh, exam preparation outline. It's really designed more for the end of the course, but it's a helpful tool to go through it, uh, uh, you know, at least in the order that it's there. So let's start with our first enduring understanding. Balance between government power and individual rights has been a hallmark of American political development. Okay. And obviously, if you've been studying, you know that a lot of uh, there's a lot of information uh, in this unit about the Declaration and, and some of the founding documents and stuff. So we have these ideas of limited government, natural rights, popular sovereignty, republicanism, social contract. You need to know what each of those terms mean, and you need to be able to identify examples of them. So, for example, when you see a provision in the Constitution uh that uh such as i'm just going to use the example of the uh constitution first let's do the first amendment okay so this is this is a copy of the constitution by the way you also have okay congress shall make no law respecting establishment of religion so a lot of the provisions that's a limitation on congress a lot of the provisions in the constitution are written to limit government and that's how the founders believed anyway that you maximize uh, liberty okay um, so you need to know the ins and outs of the Declaration of Independence. Okay, so basically, uh, you know, you had the assignment, the breakup letter, obviously it's, it's a separation uh, from Britain. But importantly, the Declaration also has a uh, statement of purpose, beliefs about government, philosophical beliefs, and of course the Constitution was designed to put those things into effect. Okay. So, um, I had to set the sound, otherwise the people are in the waiting room and I don't know, so I apologize for the uh, distraction there. Okay, so make sure you've looked at the Declaration of Independence. And if we go to required reading, you can look at it. Here it is, the Declaration. I do a lot of screen sharing, by the way, with all this stuff. So if I'm ever rambling on and assuming that there's something on the screen and it's not there, please let me know. Okay, so here's the Declaration of Independence. Okay, so it has basically a statement of intent, a statement of beliefs about government. Okay, and let's go through some of those. Unalienable rights, okay, also known as natural rights. Uh, endowed by their creator. So some people say these are God-given rights. You know, they tried to, I don't know, the, you know, you can use whatever descriptor you like. But uh, the fact is, if you are alive, uh, the founding fathers believed that you had these certain rights and life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That's kind of the, the core. Now, um, let's go back to the outline. Okay. So 
Also in there is a line about popular sovereignty. Okay, so if you look at this part of the declaration right here, um, so to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. Okay, so they're believers in this idea of popular sovereignty. And then this next line is what we refer to as the social contract. Whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it's the right of the people to alter or abolish it and institute new government. Okay, so um, that's the gist of the declaration. Again, don't forget it was, it was a big... Um, and by the way, the, the bulk of the declaration is all of the things that the King of England had been doing that the, the colonists felt were unjust and they're thereby laying the groundwork for the justification for revolution, which is no small thing, by the way. That's a really, really big deal to revolt against a uh, country. Okay. Um, these models of representative democracy, make sure you know what these are, participatory democracy where the people are involved, pluralist democracy, which is uh, what Madison uh, largely wrote about in Federalist 10, which is upcoming for you guys, but uh, um, pluralism is where there's lots and lots of groups competing. So we see this all the time with, you know, whether it's Black Lives Matter, whether it's, uh, so, you know, some LGBT uh, kind of uh, activism where you know not everybody's going to get every policy that they want and so there's a natural competition that exists that's what we mean by pluralism and elitism is a suggestion that uh, there's a select few so an oligarchy would be a form of elitism where there's a group of people by the way speaking of that um, i do want to go over and show you the textbook if you haven't seen it this is from the textbook okay just looking at the exam they it's it's pretty evident that you're expected to have read this chapter. And I would say this probably more than anything else, because this, I was kind of surprised on the exam. There's a lot of, um, which by the way, I did not write, but <laughs> there's a lot of information, a lot of questions about these basic uh, concepts. So the idea of equality and, uh, you know, consent of the governance stuff. I'm going to stop the screen share for a minute. I'm going to hop on. I'm going to actually take a look at the exam so I don't lead you astray. Any questions so far? Okay, uh, just, and again, this is not, I'm not giving away answers here, but I'm just kind of giving you some idea of the sorts of things that you'll want to look for. Okay, you have to know, you have to know the Constitution, the basics, not all of it. You need to know Article 1 is Congress, because this, this is the part where I would start taking notes. <laughs> okay, <laughs> you need to know that Article 1 is about Congress. It set forth things like the lawmaking process and uh, establishes some basic checks and balances, uh, presidential veto, things like that. You need to know that Article 2 is the presidency. Okay, it establishes the presidency. Article 3, the judiciary, and also in Article 3, you need to know that the only court that it set up was the Supreme Court, and all of the other courts were delegated to Congress, uh, which Congress created almost immediately with the Judiciary Act of 1789. There are some questions that involved uh, reading charts and graphs. So those I can't help you too much with other than just to kind of say to, um, you know, take your time with them. It is a timed exam, but uh, you do want to make sure you're not, uh, you know, doing anything and answer, you know, getting off topic and things like that, you know, make sure you have the big picture of the infographic. Okay. Um, There is a question about oligarchy, okay? Oligarchy is a form of government where you have, you know, gr uh, groups of people, an elite few. So some kind of cynically say that's what we have right now because we have these big companies that are dumping gazillions of dollars to, you know, manipulate elections. That's kind of a, kind of a cynical viewpoint, but also maybe a little bit of truth to it, which makes it uh, interesting to think about anyway. But uh, of course we are a republic we have elections and all that stuff, but uh, um, but in an oligarchy, um, again, a select few of people are involved. So make sure you know what the definition of an oligarchy is. Okay. Um, some really interesting questions in here. Um, make sure you've looked at the preamble, the preamble to the constitution. Let me screen share that and hop over to the one second. Okay. 
So the, the Constitution itself has a preamble, as does the Declaration of Independence. And you're probably familiar with it, but just for a good measure. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, and promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution. Now, there are questions about each of these goals. Okay. There's questions about what it means to establish justice, ensuring domestic tranquility. Okay. So if the National Guard were called out because, you know, people were rioting in a city, that's domestic tranquility. Okay. Um, if someone is arrested for committing tax fraud, establish justice. Okay. So there's, there, again, there's some questions about some of these basic ideas that uh, are probably good to think about. Okay. Um, so just be aware of that. Um, make sure you've looked at the major, in fact, I'm going to go ahead and uh, uh, do you guys a favor here. Let me screen share this for a second. Okay. So in this resource, again, this is the uh, comprehensive review outline. Okay. Um, there's some uh, information in the back that I think is going to be pretty helpful to you guys. And one of those is a, if I can find it here, hang on. Oh yeah, quick reference guide. Okay, this is on page 76 of this outline. Again, this is not in the Canvas material set. This is what was sent to you guys through the attachment. This is stuff that I prepared. Okay, um, and here is something very helpful for this exam. It has all of the articles of the constitution broken down. Okay, so Article 1, best legislative power in a bicameral legislature, basically establishes Congress. Uh, Article 2, best power in the president. Article 3, best power in the judiciary. Article 4, deals with interstate relations, full faith and credit clause. Article 5, deals with the amendment process. And Article 6 is the supremacy clause. Article 7 is about ratification and put that like, kind of basic uh, information. I was a little bit surprised that in unit one, they actually do have a question about each of the articles. So you do need to know what each article is about. So for example, article six, the supremacy clause, article two, the presidency article, we kind of went through that already. Okay. So just be aware that that's there again, that's on page 60, 76, 77 of the uh, comprehensive outline that, that I sent out. Um, there's also a bunch of other quick, quick reference charts and stuff like that that are helpful. Uh, there's about one about all the cases that you have to know. So if you, again, just to be able to have that know where it is and stuff like that and know that it's not just something I sent out randomly, it's actually got a lot of useful stuff, especially for a class like this where it's really compacted. Okay, um, look at some other things that might help you guys. Um, all right, let's go back to the outline and I'm just going to kind of talk through some of this stuff here. If you ever have a question, you can use the chat or you can just uh, speak up and that's fine. All right, so let's go through um, this next section of the outline. How are models of represent representative democracy visible in major institutions, policies, events, or debates in the United States? Okay, um, let me show you what I'm looking at. Participatory democracy uh, is where people, you know, actively participate. They vote. Uh, they um, are civically engaged. There's a, there's a couple of questions about civic engagement, okay, political efficacy, things like that. Um, I don't know if you've been introduced to that vocabulary yet, but political efficacy is the uh, extent to which a person feels that they are empowered politically, okay? So if their vote matters, they have a high political efficacy. Okay. Pluralism, again, again, group competition, elitism, uh, rule by a select few. Okay. Um, I'm going to skip ahead because I don't see a lot of questions about Federalist 10 and Brutus 1. I think that's more the next unit. Um, oh, my phone is ringing. Hang on. <laughs> okay. Um, and let me verify that one, one second. Hang on. Sorry if I'm a little discombobulated today. Uh, 
Okay, there's a question about the Great Compromise. Does everybody know what the Great Compromise is? So the Great, so at the Constitutional Convention, there was uh, a debate about how the state should be represented. So there was the large state plan, it's called the Virginia Plan, which featured population-based representation. There was the New Jersey plan, which was the you know, equal representation idea that all the states would be represented equally. The problem is the states were very, very different. New York was a completely different situation than Virginia, for example. So instead of doing one or the other, they combined them. That's what the Great Compromise is. And of course, the, what resulted from the Great Compromise was uh, a, a bicameral legislature. And of course, um, the big, the big deal was it resolved the issue of representation in Congress by splitting Congress into two parts. So you have the, the population base in the House and you have the equal in the Senate. Okay, just another reminder to know your articles. There's questions about each of the articles. So once again, Article 1, Congress. Article 2, the Presidency. Article 3, the Courts. Article 4, State Relations. Interstate Relations. Article 5, the Amendment Process. And Article 6, the Supremacy Clause. So just that, that's rote memorization. You just got to know it. Okay. There's some interpretive questions about um, the declaration. Uh, those are pretty straightforward. I don't think you're gonna have too many problems with those. Um, and uh, as far as, uh, let's see, again, know your definitions, pluralism, participatory, elite, make sure you study those definitions and know what they are. Okay. Um, there are some questions about checks and balances and separation of power. So let me kind of talk you through those. Okay. And there's a difference, by the way, separation of powers, legislative power is unique from, uh, you know, legislative power is the power to create legislation, create laws. Executive power is administrative. It's carrying out the laws. Judicial power is interpretive. You interpret the laws. And so you separate key functions of government. And then you allow them to have power over each other so that Congress writes the laws, but the president can veto if he doesn't like it. Okay. Uh, Congress can override a presidential veto, but the Supreme Court can override them. And by the way, the Supreme Court got its uh, judicial review power. Um, we're going to talk about this later on, but uh, um, through, I think most of you know, Marbury versus Madison, very important Supreme Court case, but also one of the Federalist Papers we're going to study later in the course, Federalist 78, was expressly argued for that power. And again, that's considered a key check and balance. There are a couple of questions about the Articles of Confederation. So we haven't really talked about that. Let's talk about the Articles of Confederation. Um, the Articles of Confederation was, and by the way, um, I know that uh, some of you had trouble with one of the links on there. So that's why I really prefer uh, the materials that I sent out to you guys, um, just because it has, uh, in fact, there you can look. Okay, there you can see it right there is the, the Articles of Confederation. Okay, um, this document was a reactionary attempt at creating a constitution. What I mean by that is the Articles of Confederation created a very weak decentralized government. There was virtually no power under the articles given to the national government. And that was expressly because of their experience with the British. They didn't want to repeat of a situation where an all powerful national government could, you know, take away liberties. So the states were given nearly all of the power. And to the extent that the, and, and there were a few laws passed under the Articles of Confederation, mostly dealing with land and things like that, adding new states. Okay. But it was completely up to the states to enact those policies. The national government was completely powerless. Probably the number one deficiency under the Articles was the inability of the national government to tax, followed by the inability to have a, a, re, a meaningful national defense. There was no, um, armed forces, uh, states were uh, relied upon for providing, providing defense, and that's just not workable. So watch out on the exam. There is a question about that. The Articles of Confederation failed because it was too weak. Okay, very simple. 
Um, I have a question. Is the test all multiple choice? The first exam is all multiple choice, yes. As we go further in the course, the, the reason for that is because most of the FRQs, the free response questions involve knowledge of you know, more than what you can do in a single unit. So as we get further along in the course, there will be more uh, response questions. Okay. So just, and, and again, the, the thing that caused the Articles of Confederation to fail, the thing that's most noteworthy is, is of course, uh, Shays' Rebellion, which was a tax revolt and um, there was no military to, to put it down. So the, that was the point when the, the they call it the grand, um, oh, I'm forget, forget what they call it now, but the, that's when the Constitutional Convention met and that's when they decided to, to change everything. Okay, look at some other, <clears throat> and there are some comparisons about, uh, and again, if you just focus on centralized versus decentralized power, power is much more centralized under the constitution. Okay, we had a federal government, we had a, a new form of government, federalism, where you have a national government and state governments together. Okay, um, I think that's, let's see if there's anything I'm leaving out. Uh, I would not say most of the questions come from the textbook, but I would say a fair number of them do. And it looks to me just based on looking at the infographics and stuff like that, there is quite a bit of reliance on the textbook for this unit. Now, I'm not sure that's gonna be the case for sub subsequent units, but there's a lot of stuff that is tested that I did not frankly expect uh, and I sound if, I, if it sounds like I'm surprised uh, last year I had no access to the exams they were locked <laughs> so this I don't know they, there's a change in in canvas and, and proctorio that that allows me to see them now so um, not that I'm giving you any answers but uh, you know it is helpful to, to to know you know at least how to prepare in that regard so um, okay and Again, each of the major terms um, there is fair game. So let me go back and just talk about a couple other things real quickly and then uh, we can wrap it up here. Um, okay. So let's go through each one of these. Natural rights, popular sovereignty, because there are questions on each of these ideas. Natural rights is the idea that rights and liberty generally is not obtained through government, but rather preserved by placing limitations on government because everybody's born with rights. Popular sovereignty is the idea that people are involved in government. We do that through a republic. A republic is the main feature of a republic is we have elected leaders and regularly scheduled elections. I guess I just defined that one. So once again, republicanism, the idea that we have elected leaders regularly scheduled elections. Social contract is the idea that there is an, uh, an unspoken contract that exists between government and the people. The number one job of government, according to the founders, is to preserve liberty. You do that by placing limitations on government. If, if government gets out of control, people have a right to change that. But the beauty of republicanism, and you'll see this when you read Federalist 10, the beauty of republicanism is what it, what it does is it... Uh, avoids the likelihood of you know unrest that you kind of typically see preceding a revolution because you have the opportunity to have uh, regular elections, which is why fair elections are so incredibly important because uh, if people perceive them to be unfair, then you can you can also get unrest. But uh, okay, at this point, um, I'll take questions. I think I've gone over most of what you're going to need for, for unit, the unit one exam. Again, my best advice is to look through all the activities you've done and uh, do read the textbook. This is uh, probably the only unit where I would say definitely you want to at least skim through the textbook and especially any definitional stuff that's in there. Okay. Questions. quiet punch. Um, okay, so if there's no questions, I'm going to assume that we're good to go. Um, if you don't have any questions, you can log off and uh, we'll call it a day. Um, if you do have questions about the exam or the course or anything, um, stick around and I'll, I'll try to answer them. Otherwise, I guess we're done.